Hi, my name is Jessica Nishikawa. I'm going to be demonstrating a few of the basic techniques of the cardiovascular and peripheral vascular system today. These videos are meant to supplement your learning and are not intended to be completely comprehensive or replace your readings or lectures. Hi, I'm McKenna. I'm Jessica. Uh, I'm going to be the nurse practitioner today doing your, um, your cardiovascular and peripheral vascular examination. You're going to hear me speaking so that the students at home and the videos can, can hear what I'm talking about and uh, see the techniques. Okay, so um, we're going to start by assessing Makana's uh, JVP or jugular venous pressure and his carotid artery. By convention, you always want to be on the right side of the patient so that you can listen appropriately and see the right side uh, of, the, um, of the veins and arteries. So go ahead and turn your head to the left. And right now I'm trying to identify where his ex external jugular vein is and you can usually see it right here and then you're looking for the pulsation of the internal jugular vein so you can't necessarily see the internal jugular vein because it's too deep but you should be able to see the pulsation of the vein if you can't you can use some tangential lighting to, t to, to take a look with Makana here you can't see it you can see it actually right here in the suprasternal notch um, which is often the case in someone who does not have JVP, it'll be too low um, and it actually will be in that suprasternal notch um, and not up in the, uh, the neck. You could rotate the bed uh, flatter um, in a more supine position to see if that JVP, if the pulsation moves up into um, the lower half of the neck. If the pulsation was really high, I would put the head of the bed up to lower that um, pulsation to the lower um, mid part of the neck. Uh, since Makana's pulsation is right here, just above the suprasternal notch, I'm going to grab two tools. One is just a straight edge. Uh, in this case, I just grabbed a tongue depressor, but you could use a card, any sort of straight edge. Uh, and you go straight out, so put that horizontal from where, the, um, where you're seeing the highest point of the pulsa pulsation. And then with a ruler uh, at the sternal notch, You measure up, and in this case, it is 1.5. Uh, in a normal patient, anything under uh, three centimeters is normal. So Makana's uh, 1.5 uh, centimeters is within normal limits. The next step is to um, assess the carotid pulse. Uh, again, go ahead and look straight for me, Makana. Um, you want to avoid checking up in the higher aspect of the neck where the carotid sinus is. Um, if you massage the carotid sinus, it can cause a reflexive drop in blood pressure and heart rate. So you want to avoid the upper half of the neck and instead feel for the carotid in the lower half of the neck. Um, you may need to displace um, the sternocleidomastoid muscle in order to, to feel this. So palpate right there and you can also palpate the other side. And you never want to palpate both sides uh, simultaneously. That uh, can cut off blood flow to the brain. So palpate one side. While you're palpating this, you, you're looking and feeling for the amplitude uh, and the upstroke. It should be a brisk upstroke. Uh, if you're listening to the heart as while you're feeling this, the carotid upstroke happens right after S1 and before S2. That is helpful uh, if the heart rate is, is really fast and you can't differentiate between S1 and S2 while you're listening. You can, also, you can listen and feel, uh, feel the carotid pulsation and you can kind of um, identify which one's S1 and S, which one's S2. Next, I'm going to use my stethoscope and listen over the carotid artery for bruise. This is important to do in someone who is um, middle-aged or older, anybody that you suspect to have cerebral vascular disease, um, and if you felt a thrill. So part of your assessment when you're palpating is to feel uh, for thrills, which is a um, cat-like cat purring. So you'll feel that sort of cat purring or that vibration. Uh, and if, that's, if you felt that, then you would need to assess for bruise. I'm going to listen with both the bell and the diaphragm of my stethoscope. And again, you would listen to both sides, not just one. I'm going to listen to just his right side for, for now. Good. And then the bell. Good. Know that if someone has an aortic murmur uh, that, that radiates, a lot of times aortic murmurs will radiate up to the neck, so you, 
you may mistake uh, what you think is a brewery, but it's actually um, a cardiac murmur. So uh, make sure you listen well over the cardiac structures to see if that there's a, a murmur there that's just radiating up to the neck. The next part of the cardiovascular examination is focused on uh, the percordium and, and, the, and the cardiac functions. So um, inspection always starts our, um, our examination. So I'm just inspecting his chest, looking for any ventricular pulsations, any, um, any pulsations. Sometimes you can see the uh, point of maximal impulse so that will actually be visible in someone who doesn't have much musculature or someone who is very thin and cachectic. In this case, I don't see it pulsating. Uh, so I'm going to next palpate with the pads of my fingers. I'm going to palpate in multiple, in a, a number of different areas, starting with his right sternal border at the second intercostal, and then moving over to the left sternal border at the second intercostal space. And on the left side, I'm gonna move my fingers down from the second intercostal space down to the third and the fourth and the fifth all the while feeling for um, thrills, feeling for any heaves, what we call heaves or lifts, which are um, pulsations that, um, impulses that will bring my hand, lift my hand or my fingers up. So I'm feeling again, uh, the right sternal border, second intercostal space, that's the aortic area. Uh, the pulmonic area, which is the second intercostal space on the um, left sternal border, and then walking my fingers down to third, fourth, and fifth, which is what we call herbs point in here between the third and the fourth and the fifth intercostal space. Um, from there, I'm going to move over to the mid clavicular line in the fifth intercostal space. So stay in the same intercostal space and just walk your fingers more laterally to the mid clavicular line and feel for the point of maximal impulse. This is the apex of the heart, and here you should feel the pulsation of the, the ventricle pulsation, and it should kind of come up and tap your finger. If you can't feel it, then have the patient, and I'm going to have the kind of do this just so you can see, roll to his left, go ahead and roll to your left, and that brings the impulse down a little bit. So again, I'm just feeling once again for that impulse, and there it is. Good, and come back on your back. So that's palpation of the of the heart. We don't percuss heart borders anymore. It's um, there's too much you know in Makana there's going to be too much musculature to, to really get a good palpation of the heart. Uh, in women the breast tissue gets in the way, so the heart borders aren't generally percussed anymore. The next step is auscultation of the cardiac, uh, and we're going to auscultate over those same areas that we did when we were um, palpating. I'm going to start uh, with my bell, or excuse me, I'm going to start with the diaphragm. And then I'm going to move through the bell and do the same motions over with the bell. So second intercostal space on the right, on the left, down to herbs point, inch your stethoscope inch by inch down the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and then over towards that mitral valve, the apex of the heart, the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line. All the while you're, you're listening for murmurs, you're listening for normal S1, S2, any um, extra sounds like an S3, S4, or a split S2. A split S2 can be normal or it can also be abnormal. A normal split S2 is uh, pronounced when the patient is um, inhaling. So if you have the patient take a big deep inspiration, you might hear a split S2, which is the sound of the pulmonic and the aortic valve closing separately. Usually they close together to form um, S2. If there is a little bit of a split there, uh, because the pressure's in the, in the um, lungs when you take a deep breath uh, in, then they'll close slightly um, behind each other and you'll hear, uh, you'll hear it as two separate beats instead of one solid beat. Next, I'm gonna have Makana sit up, right? And I'm going to listen again, uh, paying special attention Paying special attention, sorry, my hands are cold, Makana. Paying pe special attention to that um, left herbs point, so the left intercostal space um, in the second, third, and fourth, and then also down into that mitral area too. Lean forward for me. Good, and listening again for uh, the soft aortic insufficiency murmurs that may be apparent only when the patient's leaning forward. 
Very good. Good. Go ahead and lean back. That concludes our cardiac exam. We're going to move on now to the peripheral vascular system. I'm going to start with the abdomen. Um, assessments always start with inspection, so I'm inspecting the abdomen for uh, aortic pulsations, which a lot of times you will be able to see. In Makana here, you can't really see it because his um, muscles, he's got too much muscle mass, but, um, and in some people who have more central adiposity, you also won't be able to um, visualize the pulsation, but you should be able to um, palpate it. Uh, but first, I'm going to actually listen to the aortic pulsation. I'm listening for bruies, which are vascular sounds like um, turbulence in, in the blood flow. So I'm going to listen starting above the umbilicus with the bell and the diaphragm. The bell is actually better to listen for vascular sounds. Then the aorta splits off to the iliac and renal arteries. So you could also listen down to the bifurcation where it bifurcates to the iliac and then out further to the renal and then finally to the femoral which is down in the inguinal canals. I'll keep McCona dressed for this but uh, if this was a, um, a real clinical situation his pants would be down so you can actually visualize the, the femoral arteries. Um, some of those pulses are actually palpable. Uh, the aorta you should be able to palpate in, in the epigastrum of the stomach. So deeply palpate right in the epigastrum and then you can, um, epigastric area, then you can actually map out how wide it is by separating your fingers and feeling that pulsation. You can also feel the femoral arteries um, down in, in sort of that um, crux of the, of the thigh there and the hip, one side and then the other. Good. Next, I'm going to move on to the upper extremities, feeling um, or inspecting, and then feeling. Um, so inspecting first just for color, and then feeling for warmth. Start at the shoulder, work your way down, feeling for warmth of the hand of the extremity, and you would do both sides. Once you get down to the end of the hand, you're going to look uh, for capillary refill just to make sure that the capillaries are responding well. Um, when you check capillary refill, you uh, depress the nail to the nail bed for a couple seconds and then you let go and the nail bed should blanch and then should pink up within, um, within a second or two. Uh, I'm going to feel for pulses, the radial pulse here in, in the um, just proximal to the thumb in this little groove here, so feel for the radial. Then feel for the brachial radialis. Good. Um, and then we're going, again, you would, you would assess both sides. Um, now we're going to move down to the lower extremities. Again, we're going to start um, with, at the superior aspect and palpate distally and make sure that it's warm. Um, good. Another good indicator of the peripheral vascular system uh, is hair on the toes. If there's no hair on the toes, if the skin's really shiny, then you can uh, infer from, from that that the uh, vasculature uh, may be compromised down there. So after you palpate the area and feel for any, um, f feel for the warmth, you're looking for edema, especially around the ankles, press your fingers in uh, to the ankles, to the feet, and look for any depressions that your fingers leave in there from uh, pitting edema, third spacing, that sort of thing. I'm going to assess the popliteal pulse. Uh, to do that, um, you cup your fingers around the back side of the patient's knee and slightly ex um, flex the knee so that you can really kind of dig your fingers into that popliteal fossa in the back of the knee. Um, keep, I, I uh, tell students to use both hands and have your fingers touch and then move them out slightly uh, about a half an inch at a time, a couple, uh, like a centimeter at a time, uh, in order to eventually fill that pulse. And then you're going to feel for the pulses, the um, dorsalis pedis pulse in the anterior aspect of the foot, and then the posterior tibialis, which is around that medial malleolus. Very good. The last part of the peripheral vascular assessment that I'm going to show you today is called Holman sign. It's a very non-specific sign that um, isn't used a whole lot in clinical practice today, but it's important to know um, to rule in or rule out DVT. It really doesn't rule in or rule out, but it, it helps you make your mind up clinically if you need to get um, other diagnostics. Holman's sign is uh, dorsiflexion of the foot and palpation of the calf. 
squeeze the calf uh, at the same time to see if that produces any pain with dorsiflexion of the foot. The calf shouldn't be too tender, but occasionally if the patient uh, has quite a bit of pain when you dorsiflex the foot, that can be a positive Holman sign and can lead you um, down the path to, to be suspicious for DVT if there's other clinical symptoms and, and signs. That concludes the peripheral vascular and cardiovascular examination today. Thank you.